Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on executive insight into the role of penetration testing. We're very uh, thankful that you're with us today to talk about this uh, important topic. Our company is a CPA firm and PCI qualified security assessor that focuses on information security audits, including things like uh, pen tests. And so we're typically hired as an outside firm and an external independent uh, auditor to come in and, and perform testing in order to validate a company's information security controls. Some of the things that we offer on, on your screen here, SOC audits, PCI, HIPAA, high trust, GDPR, ISO, FISMA, and in the world of penetration testing, we perform network testing, application testing, APIs, wireless, and on and on. Uh, some of the things that people will look to us for as far as guidance and assurance relate to performing gap analysis work, remediation plans, developing policies and risk assessments that support a company's overall compliance goals. So if we can help you in any of those areas, please do let us know. Our company publishes a lot of content on uh, these topics, and so if these uh, issues are relevant in your world and to your position and, and something that you can benefit from, we'd love for you to take advantage of our content by visiting us at kirkpatrickprice.com. We post regularly about uh, current issues and trends and news and updates about data breaches and security vulnerabilities that are discovered. We have a lot of recorded webinars in our database that you can pull down and, and watch if there's some past topics that interest you. And we would invite you to connect with us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook to follow some of that uh, news and update activity that we have. My name is Joseph Kirkpatrick, and I'm the founder here at Kirkpatrick Price. And I'm a certified individual that just really loves the topics of data security and IT governance. Um, a lot of these things sometimes can be very confusing for our clients um, when you have an issue that you have to comply with or you have to learn about in a short amount of time, that's where we really shine. We really love helping you with that, learn about what the requirements are and helping you figure out how to comply with all these challenging things that are out there today. And so today in this executive insight into the role of penetration testing, the things that we want to cover are some creative approaches to pen testing, ways that um, maybe you should consider doing pen tests that typically aren't involved in some of the more traditional and routine tests that are performed out there today. And I also want to speak to the executive issue about how you use pen testing in your governance approach. And so whether you are an executive who is overseeing this type of function or whether this is the type of information that you could take to your executives to explain their role in a penetration testing project and what the organization should be striving to get out of it. Um, it's, it's a topic that I think is really important and I wanna cover uh, some of that today so that executives out there can understand what their role is in this service that sometimes they think they have nothing to do with. Also, we wanna talk about how to overcome some of the fears and misperceptions about penetration testing and what this role of an outside firm is when you hire an independent auditor to validate your controls. What, what does that look like and, and why is that important? So those are the main uh, points I want to hit on and, and make sure that we get out of our time together today. And so I want to start with just an example because I think that some of the philosophical uh, thoughts that come out of the CBS series, Undercover Boss, relates to this. I'm the type of person that usually will watch a TV show a couple times when it's new and then I kind of move on, but I'm picky about the ones that I watch and it really has to capture my attention. And Undercover Boss, when it first came out, it has been years ago, but it caught my attention because I was like, this is really an interesting concept that when you're the leader of an organization and you want the straight story about what's going on in your organization, sometimes you have to go uncover, undercover to get the truth. And 
get an unfiltered view of that. And that was what was so fascinating to me about the program was that you had a leader of a company that was looking for a creative way to make a difference and oversee their particular um, organization. And putting aside the questions about, is this show real? Is it fake? Are you kidding me? They didn't recognize the CEO of the company wearing the fake, you know, mustache or wig or whatever it was. Um, there were some compelling things that came out of the show whenever the CEO got to meet the people on the front lines of their company. And they wouldn't have been able to meet them uh, had they not undertaken this undercover effort to do it. And so I want to use that um, program and what was going on there as a way to frame some of our conversation about the role of penetration testing in your own organization. And I think it's a, a, a difference between routine and creative. In the corporate world, a CEO can say, I'm going to go visit a site today. I'm going to talk to the people. I'm going to shake hands with them. I'm going to talk to the customers. And, you know, I'm just going to see what's going on in the, in the field. And that's very routine. You hear about that thing all the time. Uh, I'm going to walk through the plant and I'm going to inspect our quality controls. Um, I'm going to call a key member of my team and I'm going to have them come to this committee meeting. I'm going to have them come to this executive council and I'm going to have them do a presentation about what's going on in their department. And the problem with the routine is that you're going to get a very filtered story in any of those situations that we talked about there. Um, I remember multiple times in my career when we were expecting a big wig to come in or even in school, I remember when we would have open house for parents to come in to the school, the school was cleaner than it typically was. And the decorations were nicer. And, uh, you know, there was, there was extra effort put into putting the best foot forward and making it look maybe sometimes like something that it really wasn't on a regular day. And so when the executives come in for that walkthrough or the executives want someone from another department to come in and, get, and give a report on how it's going, you're going to get a version of the story because that's a very routine way of handling that. And people know how to do that. I need to put a presentation together that makes me look good um, I have a conflict of interest here because I want to get a promotion and I, I don't want to get fired and I want to make sure that everything looks like it's fine and dandy. And so I'm going to, you know, hide this information or color it in a way that doesn't make it seem so bad, even though maybe we do have uh, some problems that I, I'm not allowed to share because my, my boss is looking over my shoulder and they're listening to what I'm saying to this person that they report to. And so that's just, that's very routine. We've all seen that. And we know that that is what happens day in and day out. And so let's contrast that with this creative approach that Undercover Boss did. They were trying to strip away the, the routine. They were trying to say, how can this CEO actually find out what's going on in their plant, in their operations, out in the field. And so that's what's so entertaining about the show is, I know, we'll put them in a costume, we'll create this scenario, and we'll put them just live in the game so that people interact with them normally, they can let their guard down, they can treat them as a coworker, and the CEO can actually see what's going on. And why is this so important to get to that? Like, however you choose to make that happen, it is important for executive leadership to have a clear view of what's going on operationally because they can't uh, fulfill their responsibility in overseeing the effectiveness of the organization 
if they don't have that clear view. And so, um, you know, there are lots of stories about companies, executives who were surprised when there was a data breach or they were surprised when the company had a loss because the accounting department wasn't doing something properly and it just hadn't made its way up to the CFO. And so getting the real story has a lot of value and that's where penetration testing can actually support that effort. But you would ask yourself some questions like, instead of just routinely saying, let's do our pen test this year the way we always do it, let's evaluate these systems over here because those are the systems we've always evaluated and that's the way we do it. This is the company we use to do our pen testing and these are the services that they offer and so let's just do that again. That's routine, but creative executives would say, hey, I'm not a technical person, but I do want the real story about what's going on uh, with our with our security controls. And so let's let's talk about how an attack would actually occur. What are the ways that we could best simulate what's truly going on? And let's test those things because we want it to be real, we want it to be valid, and we want to step into the real environment and see what's, what's going on. And so in one episode of Undercover Boss, um, this is the CEO of Donato's Pizza, and her name is Jane Abel, and she did this. She wanted to get in the real environment, and so you can see the disguise that they had for her so that she could be a frontline worker. She went to four different places in four different roles, and she was able to learn and see for herself exactly what was going on, and that's what she wanted to know. How could this actually happen? What could actually occur in our operations? And let me just see it for myself. And, you know, one of the things that um, we're concerned about when we do this is this is a riskier proposition. Taking on a, uh, a creative approach to evaluating our own operations or performing penetration testing like this, it's very it's very risky because maybe we're um, fearful of embarrassment. Uh, what will they find and what will happen? And she was interviewed about this episode and she said, you know, that was the concern going into this because it was a TV show and it's being recorded. The unknown of what's going to happen is very concerning because what if one of our employees makes us look bad? Um, you know, what, could happen then. And that same risk exists in this. If you do a very real world attack simulation, one of your systems may fail, one of your people may make the wrong choice. And so there's this risk of well, what if this happens? But at the end of the day, the benefit for her outweighed the risk in actually seeing what actually does occur. And so uh, that risk was one that she was willing to take. We're always worried about our employees and, you know, what if somebody, you know, does something wrong and they, uh, they click on a link and they're the ones that are responsible for, you know, are we going to fire them? And then people throughout our organization are going to be uh, on edge because they're like, oh, the, the executives are testing us and they're looking at these results. And if I mess up, um, I might get fired. And you don't want that in your security culture within your organization because if people are only pursuing compliance and pursuing security because they're fearful of losing their job, you don't have an effective security culture. And so taking on the risk of testing your employees and allowing them to fail and learning from that failure and using the positive stories of what happens during testing as a way to encourage other positive behavior and using the negative stories as a way to say lesson learned. Um, one of the things I tell our clients when 
an employee messes up and they're responsible for the critical failure of a security control, that person will never do that again. If you, if you trust them and you um, teach them about what happened, that person will be one of your strongest advocates in your security culture because you didn't fire them and you, um, you trusted them enough to teach them and allow them to take the next step in their career and learn from their mistake and now be an advocate for you. And that's, that's a creative approach as opposed to the routine approach of just telling your people, you know, don't make mistakes, don't click on links, don't let strangers into sensitive areas. Um, rather than doing that, using this approach like she did to come in and evaluate the situation uh, outweighs the risk of that. And one of the things that I think outweighs these risks is just, it's a stronger test. You know, rather than, I, I just saw online today um, a post where somebody said, they asked the CEO, um, how do you make sure that your security is good? And the CEO said, they perform um, assessments and report to us. And the CEO was told, well, I'm a teacher of a college class on cybersecurity, and I don't let my students um, give themselves their own test. And the CEO said, good point. And let's talk further about maybe a way to have a stronger test rather than letting people do self-assessments, test the controls that they implemented, test the controls that they are responsible for. You know, that's a conflict of interest to do that. And so Jane, the Donato CEO, asking employees to rate themselves and evaluate their own performance is one good feedback uh, mechanism in order to evaluate, but it's a stronger test to have it done independently so that you can use that type of testing in order to see what's really going on. And that's how you gain assurance um, is when you are able to validate that independently and not rely on self-assessments and, and people testing uh, their own departments that they have a vested interest in protecting and, and reporting on. And so what are some of these actual simulations that can occur that are the more creative approach to penetration testing rather than just having a network test? Sometimes people will tell us, well, we just want an external penetration test. We just want you to sit in a chair like you're a hacker in Eastern Europe somewhere, and we want you to, from the outside, try to hit our public IP addresses, and that's the scope of our engagement. We're not doing anything else. And some of the things that can strengthen that and make that more valid and more creative is, first of all, online research. It's such a basic thing, but organizations don't evaluate, and sometimes they have blinders on, so it's, it's better for a third party to be able to do it. But what is available about us online? Um, what is talked about in terms of our operations and our technologies that we use? What's available on the dark web? Are there passwords that um, are out there that our employees are commonly using? Um, is there information about an employee that can be utilized? This is always the first step that we take when we're engaged in one of these creative penetration tests where we're trying to find out what's actually going on because that's what a real attacker does. They will do this type of reconnaissance in order to find a security vulnerability. And one that sticks out to me that I, that I remember was that the person who was in charge of telecom at this large organization that we were assessing, we had found um, some posts about his college um, reunion. And he was excited to attend. He was going to be there. It was out of town. And we stumbled upon that. And his role 
of being involved in telecom was just perfect for what we were trying to do as an attacker in this creative scenario. And so we waited until he was gone. He was out of town. He wasn't at work. And we showed up wearing the telecom provider's polo shirt. And we had a fake work order and we had a fake phone number to call to verify that the work had been ordered by this person. And they didn't even check that when we went in. We said, you know, Bob called us and wanted us to, you know, check this out with the router. And the person said, oh, Bob isn't here. He's at his college reunion. And he didn't mention this, but come on, we'll take you back there since he's not here. And so they walked us to the locked door. They reached on top of the door frame, pulled down a key, unlocked the door and said, please lock it when you're done. And it was a, it was a big win in the test because this is the type of thing that a persistent attacker, someone who's targeting your company, targeting your people, your environment, your technologies, this is something that they would do because frankly, it's very easy to do with just a little bit of research. And that's one of the more creative approaches to um, performing an actual simulation. Entering a physical location is, is something that people don't talk about, like the scenario that I just described, but it is sometimes easier to get behind the firewall. You know, rather than just having a routine test from the outside, um, how can we gain actual assurance about our security controls? Well, our people, and our physical locations are sometimes the last line of defense. And so we have to have mechanisms to validate whether or not Bob ordered this telecom service and whether or not this person standing in front of me is a worker for the company that they say that they're working for. And so those types of procedures should be tested because you're going to find out what really is going on and whether or not uh, those kinds of controls exist within your organization. But a lot of people are, are very fearful of this. They don't wanna do the physical side of penetration testing, but much like Undercover Boss, it's a necessity to evaluate it from this side because it's really one of the only ways to get a glimpse into what your people are doing and what's happening um, out there in the field. Pretext calling is Another example of this, rather than using just simply technical means to hack into an environment, picking up the phone and calling an employee and just nicely asking for access is sometimes a way that an attacker can get into that. And that's how um, another creative approach can be applied because when you call and identify yourself as a help desk employee and you need to set up a remote session or you need them to provide some configuration information. One of the things that we always use pretext calling for is to identify the um, antivirus solution that is in place. Because if we are going to deliver some type of malware into the environment in order to uh, do some type of client side attack, it's very helpful to know what antivirus is running on uh, the network so that um, the script or the malware can be configured in a way that that particular flavor of antivirus won't detect it. And that differs from solution to solution. So picking up the phone and calling is a very creative way of testing your environment to understand exactly what's going on and what sometimes people will do over the phone that could compromise your security. Spear phishing is another one. Um, a lot of times people just want these routine phishing exercises. And, you know, we do those. Uh, we have tools that are very well known in the industry and you kind of set up a very generic approach and you send it out and you see how many people will click on it. That's very routine. But setting a, up a custom um, attack surface where you mimic a page that looks just like your internal uh, HR benefits page, let's say, or your help desk page and targeting specific people with specific messages. Hey, this is John from this department. I'm, you know, I need you to do this for me because you're in finance and, you know, you have access to this. And 
we learn about that through pretext calling and online research and all those kinds of things. And this is the type of thing that someone who has been hired to gather uh, intelligence on you or someone who is, is specifically trying to hack into your environment. These are the types of things that could happen. And that's why you should test it and see if those kinds of things can happen with you. I, I remember one engagement where the client said, we want you to send phishing emails to see who clicks on it, but we don't want you to send any emails saying you're with IT, and we don't want you sending any emails saying that you are um, an executive. And those were their rules of the engagement. And that's fine. We can establish those rules and, and put that into the scope. But what are you missing when you do that? You're missing the very attacks that the bad guys are using. They do come from IT or the help desk. They do come from the boss who is asking you to do something for them and you know reply back and click on this. And so if you don't actually test that and, and simulate those things, you can't get stronger and you can't find that you have an actual weakness there when you avoid um, going into that. And so these are the types of things that you might be missing and some specific areas that, that I see happening in uh, the pen test simulations that happen out there is that our scope is, is stale. We've always tested from the outside. We've always tested these systems and that's all we do. And we do that just because. And so breathing some life into this and some new energy into what are today's attacks and what, what is critical in our environment today and reevaluating that scope is really, really important. Web applications. Um, this is a very common issue. People just want to test the network and they leave out of their scope the sites and the methods that people use to access the environment through some type of interface. We had a client this year tell us that they weren't going to do pen testing on the web application because it had been tested last year and everything was fine. And so they were just going to do network testing this year and leave out the web app. But look at all of the changes that have occurred since last year in your environment. Look at all the, the code changes that have occurred from your developers. Look at all of the new vulnerabilities that have been identified for that web application. You know, don't leave these important um, attack vectors out that attackers are uh, exposing. And so you wonder in those kind of situations, do the executives know that? Do the executives understand what the scope is, what we're testing, what we're not testing in order to be um, very thorough about it? In my experience in talking to executives who are being appealed to about the funding and you know the expense of doing testing and things like that, they maybe they're concerned about that, but they do want the most thorough test that they can possibly get. They, they wouldn't want to leave out something that could possibly be ex exposed. And so if you are reporting to these people who fund it and maybe who don't understand the intricacies of pen testing, that's one of the talk tracks that you can use to, to help them um, understand the implications of not including something is to appeal to their desire that I believe they would have for thoroughness and completeness when it comes to uh, testing the environment. APIs is another one that is very, very important in today's world. People are testing the web application, but a very critical component of the web app are these API calls that are occurring from the outside and they allow certain functionality to occur between your technology and their technology. And I could point out the, the Facebook privacy blunder. You know, we gave all of these users, um, or all of these third parties, I should say, access to these APIs that allowed the gathering of, of large quantities of data. Um, 
did they know that? Yeah, I'm sure that they did know it, but I don't think anyone had really grasped the the implication of what could occur there if a person with malicious intent was to use that. And uh, they were a third party interested in their own use of this data and acquiring as much of the data as possible and, and using it in nefarious ways. And so those kinds of things should be tested and validated, have a third party look at that to see what could be done, because sometimes it opens the eyes of the insider who hadn't considered uh, those things that need to be done. So APIs are very, very important because there can be uh, vulnerabilities there and also use cases that hadn't been comp uh, contemplated before. Mobile platforms. This is a very common um, refrain that we hear from, from companies out there. They're doing network pen testing, they're doing web application pen testing, but they've got um, an Android app, they've got an iPhone app, and there's this platform that allows all of these mobile users to have access to the same data and the same systems that you can get through a browser on a workstation, but it's not tested. We've never tested the security of the mobile platform. And so it's not, it's not complete. It's not broad enough to think about that aspect of our environment. And so making sure that those things are identified is very, very important. Uh, Internet of Things is a hot area these days. Let's, let's see if there are other ways to get into the network that aren't as traditional. Uh, it's a more creative approach to look at some of these devices that are attached to our network but are not traditional network components. And so those are things like thermostats, but it's also in the medical world devices. There was a, a hack last year, I believe it was, dealing with a vulnerability that was released about infusion pumps that were connected to the internet for reporting, but it had a very serious security vulnerability that an attacker was able to use in order to come in through uh, that particular device that was attached. And so these are the things that we don't think about when we focus on the routine, but when we start thinking about creative ways of getting in, um, you realize that there's more attached to your network than just computers and servers and routers and things like that. Um, I wanted to especially mis mention printers here because sometimes in our tests, printers are easy to overlook because that's such a, an old method of exploit in order to gain a foothold in a network. You know, some, somebody has really locked down the environment. They've, they've hardened their servers and their network devices. The workstations are patched and up to date and people are um, conscientious about phishing links and things like that, but the printer firmware is 10 years old. It's a, it's a printer that's just been sitting there forever. And sometimes that is the way that we get a foothold into the rest of the network is by uh, exploiting something with the, um, the firmware on a, on a printer. And so that's an old method. It's been around forever, but sometimes we forget it because we're so routine in our approach to our pen testing every year. And so the thing that I encourage people to consider is your own data flow because every environment is different and no two pen tests should look the same. You shouldn't treat it as a commodity. You should look for how it needs to be organized for you. And having that undercover boss production moment where you sit down and you go, what are we trying to get out of this? What are we trying to simulate? What do we want to learn? What environments are critical? Like I mentioned in this particular episode that I'm using as an example, they went to four locations. Well, why did they go to those four locations? Because there was something about each one of those that they wanted to see and they wanted to learn from. And so they designed it specifically for the purpose of the test rather than just running a test for the sake of running a test and checking a box off somewhere. Let's think about what we're trying to get out of this and design a creative approach so that we can learn and we can get stronger um, with this. And so one of, the, one of the tests that I remember where we were reporting to the CIO on this particular test and 
the network was strong. The network was in, in good place in a good place. But we were trying to steal data. His his desire was to know could someone from the outside steal data from our network? And they had consumer data. They had consumer information. They had um, mortgage files. They had um, uh, banking information. And as we thought about the data flow, we discovered that because they were a company that sold some uh, property interests in vacation destinations, we discovered that you could call this customer service line and you could use information from public records with the address. Um, you know, this person owns this property. We had their name, we had their address, we had their phone number from public records. We could call into their customer service line and say, hello, my name is this. Here's my address. Here's my phone number. I need to verify my um, banking details with you. And they would read over the phone the routing number and the account number. And it was an arduous process. It wasn't like we could steal a million records in one sitting, but we, we did steal 30 just to prove the concept that it could be done, that they didn't have security controls on this particular part of their data flow. And I thought what was interesting about the presentation when that was one of our findings that we presented that happened, the director of IT was just not interested in that at all. Um, the attitude there was, so what, okay, not my area, not my responsibility. The CIO was very concerned about it because I think he had more of a perspective into the damage that that could do for their brand and their reputation, their regulatory compliance fines. And, um, you know, information security is not merely an IT issue. It's broader than that. And that's why executives should be involved in the scoping and the reporting and the understanding of that, because from an IT perspective, they weren't excited about it. But from the C-level perspective, they were like, we have to fix this. We have to verify people's identities before we give any information over the phone. This is a leak in the ship, and we need to um, patch that up. By the way, before I move on here, I want to say, if you have any questions, if there's anything that you want to submit for me to answer, I'm, I'm sure we'll have some time at the end based on the pace that I'm on here uh, to answer some questions. So just go into the GoToMeeting um, interface there and feel free to submit a question or a chat and we'll be happy to answer as many as we can at the end of this today. Okay, and so with that, I want to talk a little bit about um, approaches to doing penetration testing and how governance plays into some of this. And one of the things I like to talk about and point out is called the security paradox. And sometimes people will say, well, we don't let third parties come in because we don't want to give a third party any access to these things. We don't want them to have access to our mobile environment, our web apps, our network. Um, okay, maybe we'll do it from outside, but we're not going to uh, provide any access for someone to test us. And um, one of the companies that I came across a couple of years ago in our line of work was a vendor to our client, and they were a critical vendor. They were providing a critical technology to our client. They had access to the databases and the environment of our client, and they had never been through an independent audit before. And their argument was, and they talked about this proudly on their website, we don't do audits with outsiders because that's like turning the keys to the kingdom over to somebody else. Once you, once you let somebody have your network diagram, once you let somebody have your policies, once you let somebody have your IP addresses, then it's out and you don't know what's going to happen with that. And so therefore, we just don't do that. And so, of course, the flip side of that is, well, what are you missing by not allowing a third party to do that? And 
my argument is that whenever an organization takes the approach of uh, circling the wagons and saying, well, we don't share and we don't give any information, you're actually less secure because you're not um, taking part in a very viable aspect of your security approach by letting a third party look at what you're doing and giving advice and sharing information. And so the truth is that the more transparent you are, the more secure you are. And so there's a proverb about a, a closed fist and, you know, when you try to hold everything and you actually end up losing it, but an open hand brings a lot more return back to you. And that's what this security paradox is all about. Like, yes, we do want to share information about our security so that the security community can scrutinize what we're doing. And I think executives who are leading this type of function should lead from that perspective of openness and transparency for the purpose of getting stronger because you do get stronger from that. And one of the things that's very creative these days and one thing one of the things that's very popular is you know what is the value of a once a year pen test to our organization uh, you know we hire someone to do some testing and we give them two weeks to do it and you know here's access to this test environment and see what you can do and is that reality you know does that line up with what's really going on in the world today with attackers who are persistent and 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 very creative themselves and very technically astute and they work on your environment for a year or more in order to develop an approach to gaining access to your environment and so one of the moves that's happening today is this idea of continuous testing where there's an open environment that allows people to test on an ongoing basis so that it's a, a continuing storyline rather than just a once a year, one week or two week event. But there's also the concept of a bug bounty. Rather than paying a pen tester to perform one test a year, we will pay <coughs> for findings. And so here you go world, here's our test environment. Here's our application. Um, knock yourself out. We pay, you know, X amount for a critical finding. We we uh, pay X amount for um, malware or exploits that are developed that will exploit our environment. And so now your budget shifts from paying a pen tester, and now you're actually paying members of the community who are hackers, but they are hackers who love to learn, they love to play, they love to develop, and when there's a bug bounty, it behooves them to share what they've learned and what they know, and they benefit from that, and you benefit from that by getting stronger. And so this is something that's more creative, it's more real, it's a simulation, and it can help you actually become more secure by sharing that opportunity with those uh, with those uh, crowdsourced type of penetration testing. You'll get lots of feedback um, when you share information about your environment and what you're doing there. Yes, there's a risk there, but there's also a great benefit because of um, the knowledge that you get back and the help that you're sometimes amazed to find that's out there. Somebody who thought of something that you didn't, didn't think of. And so um, I wanted to share a recent example that occurred in the news here recently. And I think it speaks to uh, planning engagements and executive involvement and understanding the scope of a pen test. And you may have heard the story about a couple of pen testers were arrested recently in a courthouse. And they had in their pocket their get out of jail letter. But in this case, it didn't work. It didn't work. They went to jail. And what happened here was that there was a misunderstanding about the rules of engagement. When I read the rules of engagement, 
I saw right there that one of the allowed techniques was lock picking. And so the pen testers saw that and they said, well, we can pick this lock on this courthouse door and we can go in and now we can try to um, compromise the environment here in order to get access to court records, et cetera, et cetera. But they tripped the alarm, the police were called, they were handcuffed, they were arrested, and they were charged with breaking and entering. And in this case, the, the court put out a press release that said, this was not part of the scope. This wasn't what was intended, and they were hired to do penetration testing, but they were not hired to break into our facilities and, and steal this information. But as I said earlier, when you read the rules of engagement, it did say that lock picking was allowed. But there was so much documentation, and I can tell you from my experience, people don't read the contracts. They don't read the rules of engagement. They don't read these things. And the only way to have an understanding about your scope and your goals and objectives of your test is for executives to be involved. Because let's say that the IT department hired um, this company to do this for them. The executives, you know, the people who are the elected officials of the courthouse or whatever, they're going to they're going to dismiss that right away. They're going to throw that person under the bus. Oh, no, this wasn't approved or whatever. And so that involvement of um, what did we hire the pen tester to do? What's the goal? And understanding exactly what that means and what we're what we're trying to do here is very, very important and can't rely sometimes on people to read the fine print of a, of a document. So that's why I say that executive involvement in this particular function is key. And so I want to talk a little bit about the, the role of governance with this. And in, in a law like GLBA, it specifically says that the board of directors is responsible for overseeing the information security program. And I'm happy to say that when I first got into this line of work, in 2001, I would go in and present to boards. And in 2001, the board had a certain look. They were a certain age. They were business owners, typically, investors. And they just couldn't care less for my information security presentation. <laughs> And we were just doing it to go through the motions because the law said that the board of directors had to oversee the, uh, the information security function. And I'm happy to say that today I see a difference there. I see the, um, the demographics of boards have changed and they are continuing to change. You do have people with technical acumen now. You do have more diversity of experience on the board and those are the people who are responsible and the c-level people have a responsibility as well it's it's their name on the public filings it's their name on the policies it's their name on the budgets that are approved for these critical endeavors and it's their name that's in the press when issues happen but why isn't the C-level ultimately responsible for overseeing this function? It's because they have a vested interest in how things get reported. They have a vested interest in the performance of the organization. Why is the board supposed to be responsible? Because they are independent. A board of directors is independent, and they can have this utopian oversight of an organization they're there to protect the um, investors, and they're there to make sure that the organization is complying with laws and regulations, and they are there to make sure that the organization is operating effectively. And so if a board isn't overseeing, ultimately, if they're not getting a report of what's going on in your pen test, then that demonstrates that there's uh, some type of a problem there going on. because. When you see in this administrative line that the information security officer is there 
they generally report to a C-level individual, and then they have a dotted line to the board, which is the proper way to structure that. And so that person is the one who should engage the pen tester and make sure that the scope is correct and make sure that the results get reported to the board for proper oversight. And so this would be an example here of of a way that it should be structured. And this is a very complex organization with lots of lines of reporting that are going on. But I think it does illustrate the reality of responsibility and how something as important as a pen test that's validating our security controls can't live just within a little bubble within IT where the information may or may not get out and get reported um, to the proper roles in governance. And so an ISO is supposed to be independent from um, that IT function and have that responsibility of reporting the results and, uh, and engaging in activities such as penetration testing. And so when you structure your pen test and you think about its role in governance within your organization, I see that there are three models that work well out there. I see a centrally managed security and operations infrastructure. There's a security officer and there's a security organization and that person oversees security operations. It's separated from IT and the person at the top of that organization reports the results up the chain to the C-level, which goes to the board, et cetera. And so that's one way to do it in a larger type of environment. As you get a little smaller in your environment, uh, I see decentralized security working, but you have to have strong accountability. Um, you might have an organization that's not big enough to have a person who's solely responsible for overseeing pen testing and governance of security, but you've decentralized that into different roles and functions. You've got this person who gets the log reports and the alerts about administrative actions on the network. You've got this person over here who receives the reports of the pen tests and the vulnerability scans. And, you know, you've assigned this out and you've got shared responsibility through your organization, but that will only work if there's strong accountability from above. Hey, I need to see these reports on a monthly basis and I need critical events brought to our attention immediately once you know about them. Too often those decentralized environments will get very lax in their approach and before you know it, a year goes by and you don't realize that our security controls weren't working the way that they were supposed to. So you have to have strong accountability to maintaining that. And then the third type of model that I actually see that works here in, in governing this role of penetration testing is a matrix security responsibility with well articulated communication and control. You have given this security responsibility to various roles in IT. Um, this person is specializing in logs. This person is specializing in vulnerability management. This person is specializing in uh, monitoring. And there has to be a lot of communication and control over expectations and reporting and who has access to it. And there has to be cross checks and there have to be other people who are watching that because there can very easily be a conflict of interest when someone who's reporting operationally is responsible for these controls and there's hesitancy to share something that's not working right because we're not gonna let it out of our organization to the people who are responsible for oversight, maybe the owner of the business in this model or the, the president. And uh, uh, so there has to be a lot of communication and control over what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that it's, it's working correct. But ultimately, my advice is to have someone plan and engage and respond to the penetration testing results who is separated from the IT function. Um, it's just a healthier 
um, way to structure it, and it's a very important component to this idea of governing the uh, security and compliance uh, responsibilities. It has to be independent. There has to be accountability. There has to be reporting to those in governance, and it really follows that risk management model. You you do your risk assessment to identify what your threats are. Our threats are a hacker against this web application, and you do your evaluation, or you, you put your controls in place in order to control that risk, control those threats that could be attacking you. You do your testing of those controls. You have monitoring of those controls, and it comes back around again to assessing what your risk is in that. And so that's, that's what people in corporate governance roles can grasp onto about their responsibility in pen tests. And you know, don't let them abdicate responsibility. Um, let them take part in their aspect of it. You don't have to understand IT. You don't have to understand web development. You don't have to understand what hackers are doing. But you are corporate governance here. And you do have to um, ultimately be responsible for what's happening here because that is your role. And you have to understand what's occurring and why. And there is an opportunity to learn this stuff and get better at it. Um, I've been in so many meetings where the person who has the responsibility on the org chart is just like, just talk to these guys over here. You know, just talk to the IT people. Um, our administrator, she's the one who is responsible for this. I don't know anything about this. So I'm just going to go back to what I was doing and it, it pushes off that responsibility that they actually have to be taking on when it comes to overseeing the pen test. And you're only going to gain assurance from your testing results when you embrace that uh, responsibility and accountability. So I try to encourage people who are non-technical and uh, they avoid you know, getting involved in the pen test and the results and the findings, I, I try to encourage them to tackle the responsibilities. You know, this is something you can do. This is something that you can gain familiarity with and understand how to oversee it. And I try to pose it as a challenge to them so that they, they do allow it to function within the organization the way it's supposed to. And the other thing is just make sure that you're hiring a company that's experienced in this type of testing, they have the qualifications, they have the certifications. I see a lot of shoddy tests out there because we've got someone who knows enough to run a piece of software and that's about it. That's really the only value that they're giving. You want, you want somebody who's more experienced than that and giving you a, a better product. Um, I want to finish with this. I know I'm out of time and so I'm gonna skip past this, uh, this summary slide. There is a recording available of this um, webinar should you wanna get a copy and, and refer back to it again. And uh, you can visit our website to see the types of things that we can help you with. But I wanted to share two things. I sit on the advisory board of the University of South Florida uh, Cybersecurity for Executives Certificate Program. And they have two or three of these events every year. The next one is this month, um, but they have this periodically throughout the year. And it's a four day session for executives who are charged with overseeing this area that they're maybe not as familiar with. So if you go to cybersecurity at usf.com, you can read more about that program because that is meant to help people oversee this type of effort and, um, and do a better job of, of, uh, being an executive in this particular area. And then the other thing I want to share with everybody is that Kirkpatrick Price is going to have a monthly uh, pen testing mastermind group. This is going to be the third Tuesday of every month, 6 p.m. Eastern time via a WebEx session. And the purpose of this is for you to come with your questions, uh, ask about your security challenges, share uh, issues that you're having, and an expert pen tester will be able to look at that and give you advice and give you recommendations. And we're also going to share uh, techniques and talk about different issues and trends in that session so that you can get stronger 
in your particular environment as well. I encourage you to reach out to me, whether by phone or by email, if you have any questions. And if you did submit a question today during our session, we will respond to you um, individually with that. Thanks very much for joining and hope you have a wonderful day.